Hi there, Christopher Westfall here with an update on what's happening with Medicare. The information that I've compiled today is from a whole bunch of different sources and you'll have to bear with me as you stay with us toward the end. It gets better and better for those of you who are policy wonks and wanting to know what the latest is with Medicare. Got a lot of information here compiled from a lot of different places and some different folks who want to give their opinion on what's happening. The quick background is the direct contracting model, and I told you about this in April of 2021 before everybody was really frantic about it. And now supposedly they all are, everybody's on board, media is covering it everywhere. And uh, we are nine months early from what everybody's now freaking out about. Apparently under the Biden administration, their plan is to continue the program that began under the Trump administration, which is to take the rest of the people, the 60% of people that are on Medicare, original Medicare, real Medicare, not Medicare Advantage, and bring those people into a more commercial route. I'm going to give you their background, their opinion. And some people have accused me in the past of uh, supporting both sides, both supporting Trump and then supporting Biden. So if you're trying to figure out who I supported, it doesn't even matter. Because what I'm interested in is how does it affect our clients? How does it affect my mom on Medicare? How does it affect our people that we're trying to serve in our agency. And we help people with Medicare insurance from all the way from Alaska, Hawaii to Florida and everywhere in between. So I'm really interested in what the policy is. What are the things that are proposed and how is it going to affect our people? So in that, let me show you uh, the beginning. I was kind of giving an trick that they can do to increase the money that they're paid by Medicare. I think it's important to understand it. And I believe it's a direct threat to the Medicare program that so many of us know and love. Traditional, these things don't happen. So a lot of the things that happen to drain the trust fund to Medicare Advantage, commercial insurance companies, those don't happen in traditional Medicare. And so the for-profit private venture, private equity venture capital world has been looking at this 60% of untouched Medicare members and thinking, hmm, I want to get my hands on that. Yeah, kind of interesting. Everybody wants to get their hands on what's going on. I'm going to share my screen with you. It'll take me just a second to pull this up. I want to share with you um, an article from the Financial, uh, let's see, the Financial Times. Let me pull this one up here. Actually, first, this one is from a doctor. Let's see if get this going. And the article says, Dr. Turner warns seniors to be wary of Medicare Advantage plans. Now, in this, he's not talking about Medicare Advantage plans. I did talk about uh, President Trump last year or two years ago when he was at the villages in Central Florida, and he was talking specifically about how great Medicare was, how great the Medicare program was. But he wasn't actually talking about Medicare. He was talking about Medicare Advantage, but he had a guy come up on the stage who was talking about Medicare Supplement. So I don't want to get too lost in the weeds here, but I do want to share with you that this doctor is not talking about Medicare Advantage. He's talking about the direct contracting model, and that's proposed by CMS as a test program, a test pilot program, so that they can get more people again into the commercial realm instead of just with uh, traditional Medicare. So this doctor says, Dr. Turner, until recently I did not understand the reason for the explosion in ads for Medicare Advantage plans on television. My understanding changed after I received communication from the Physicians for a National Health Plan Organization. Medicare Advantage functions like an HMO, because they are most of them, they receive a set payment from Medicare for each enrollee and then manage how those funds are used to pay for Medicare enrollees' health care. So they're not on traditional Medicare anymore in a Medicare Advantage plan. They're on the private plan. The patient's health care options are often restricted or limited to a select panel of providers. The plans often encourage overcoding, which increases the cost of Medicare Advantage plans compared to traditional Medicare. Late in the Trump administration, even more an even more insidious effort, where's the scary music, was made to privatize Medicare. That program established direct contracting entities, otherwise known as DCEs, which, like Medicare Advantage plans, received direct monthly payments from Medicare fund for each enrollee. With DCEs, they can spend as little as 60% of the major money that they're getting from Medicare on the health care, and they can keep up to 40% for themselves. With Medicare Advantage, it's an 85% rule where they have to spend no less than 85% on care. Same thing with the Affordable Care Act. Anything above that, and they have to send you a refund check because they spent too much of the money toward themselves for profit. However, the DCEs don't have that restriction, and they're anticipating up to 40% of it is profit. Studies have also shown 
that the DCEs and Medicare Advantage plans encourage overcoding. We've talked about that before, and that's what the uh, Office of Inspector General at Health and Human Services said is the major impetus behind uh, the denial of care, which is rampant within Medicare Advantage, is the overcoding. And the use of medically questionable studies or interventions to further maximize their profit. As of April of last year, there were 53 known direct contracting entities operating in 43 states. 28 of these plans are investor owned and six more are managed by insurance companies. Traditional Medicare spends 98% of its budget on direct patient care. As mentioned above, direct contracting entities can retain up to 40% of their revenues as profit. That's a huge incentive, y'all. Huge. Just checking my messages here, make sure everything's going right. Uh, let's see here. I would urge seniors to be wary of signing up for Medicare Advantage plans since, like direct contracting entities, those plans are designed to improve financial outcomes, not clinical outcomes. I would also urge everyone to call their senators and representatives to encourage them to stop the dangerous DCE program. One could also contact uh, the Secretary of HHS, and that's from Dr. Turner, who's quoted a lot in the news. Um, and then there's this from PBN or PMN Business, and I think there's things financialpost.com, and it's called. And this is a recent article. This is just last week. A quiet experiment is testing the broader privatization of Medicare. Sounds pretty scary, doesn't it? Millions of retirees have opted into out of me traditional Medicare over the last two decades, joining privatized managed care versions of the program. But the choice might not be in their hands for much longer. Dun, dun, dun. The U.S. government has quietly launched a large-scale test of a new model for traditional fee-for-service Medicare that critics argue could transform it into another type of privatized medic managed care. Under the model, Medicare contracts with healthcare provider groups they receive a flat annual payment to provide care for enrollees in the traditional program. Pause just for a second. Here's why this is important, y'all, because you, as the senior, don't get a choice. When you are selected for the DCE experimental program, you are put into the program. They don't ask you, hey, would you like to be in a managed care operation where your physicians are incentivized to do less care and the less care that they get, they still get capitation so they make more money from the less care that they give you and you'll never know the difference. Now they're supposed to, according to the new rules, send you a letter that tells you you're going to be part of a direct contracted entity. What does that mean? That's what we're gonna tell you. So you can continue to go in to that, that physician, that primary care doctor that has either as a physician's group or the private doctor with his organization contracted to be this direct contracting entity, and they're watching everything that person does for your health care. Again, the more that they deliver, the less money that they get to keep as a net result of that. And the upcoding thing is a problem, as you'll see in a minute. So anyway, if, if this was your choice, you'd probably say, no, I don't want that. If it's not your choice, that's even bigger problem. Let's see, they are, uh, some current fee-for-service Medicare enrollees are being placed in these so-called direct contracting entities. They're just being placed in them in 38 states where the pilot test is underway. DCEs are groups of doctors, hospitals, and other healthcare providers that work as teams with the stated goal of improving quality of care and the patient experience. But they all have one thing in common with Medicare Advantage, the fast-growing managed care offering that already serves 42% of Medicare enrollees. Like Advantage plans, which are usually HMOs or PPO plans, DCEs create networks of preferred healthcare providers and they can retain as profit the portion of the annual per patient payments that are not spent on health care. Where's the incentive? What's the drawback? What's the potential negative? That's it. They get to keep the money that they don't spend on your health care. That would be a big, huge red flag. CMS describes this as part of a broader strategy to improve traditional Medicare through innovative accountable care organizations, otherwise known as ACOs and emphasizes this is only a test. Quote, CMS recognizes that better healthcare outcomes and coordination, that always worries me when they want to coordinate about me, can be achieved through many different approaches, says Dr. Liz Fowler, CMS Deputy Administrator and Director of the CMS Innovation Center. You'll hear about Liz Fowler 
in just a second in a news story that talks about the revolving door where they go from government to private, from government to private. They'll pass something as a government official and then go in the private sector and, and capitalize on what they passed as a government official. Keep that in the back of your mind, Liz Fowler. She said in an email in response to a question I submitted, quote, the direct contracting entity is simply one approach that we believe will help achieve this goal. Supporters argue that DCs will improve traditional Medicare by creating financial incentives for providers to coordinate patient care and focus on overall improvements in their health. Yeah, but the pilot test is setting off alarm bells among consumer advocacy, advocacy groups. Say so that fast three times. And some members of Congress, which you'll see in just a second, who are raising questions about how DCEs will impact patient care. They also worry about an influx of investor-led entries into the business that point to further privatization of your Medicare. Perhaps most importantly, they argue that such an important change in the structure of Medicare should require the approval of Congress rather than simply rulemaking by CMS. While the DCE program is in an early phase, this much is clear. If you enrolled in traditional Medicare and you live in an area where a DCE operates, and now it's moved away from what I talked about nine months ago, the geographic model based on where you are and where you, where you live, into who do you get your health care from? And the way to get out of it is to simply change your primary care doctor. That's what you have to do in order to opt out. You can't stay with that doctor who's already contracted with this. You would literally have to change your primary care doctor to somebody who's not participating in the DCE. So let's CMS does this by reviewing your claim history and aligning you to a DCE that your physician participates in. You will receive a letter informing you that your healthcare provider is part of a DCE. Opting out would require, and you just said this, shifting to a doctor who's not part of a DCE and Medicare officials are on the record saying that all traditional, med this is the huge big headline here. All traditional Medicare beneficiaries will be in, quote, a care relationship with accountability for quality and total cost of care by the year 2030. 53 DCEs are currently operating. Being aligned with a DCE does not change the set of Medicare benefits that you're entitled to, but it can use the techniques of managed care already prevalent in Medicare Advantage to, to do what? Limit access to services it deems unnecessary. Can I hear an amen? They want to limit access to services that they deem you don't need and to use financial incentives to encourage the use of in-network providers. Hmm. Now, this was hidden in the Affordable Care Act, by the way. Let's them do this. Critics of Medicare Advantage point to recent research documenting problems with denial of care. Hmm. In fact, a 2018 report by investigators in the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, which has been covered extensively by Christopher Westfall and nobody else, that's weird, on YouTube, found widespread and persistent pattern of inappropriate denial of patient claims on Medicare Advantage. The report also concluded that the Advantage capitation payment model may be incentivizing plans, quote, this is from the Inspector General's quote, by the way, to deny pre-authorization of services for beneficiaries and payments to providers in order to increase profits, end quote. That's not me saying it. It's just me being the only one on YouTube telling you this. In theory, Competition among health plans paid by capitation can lead to improvements in the quality and efficiency of care and save money for the federal government. But studies have concluded that Advantage plans are receiving billions of dollars, or as some people in politics say, billions and billions in overpayments because of the way that they are permitted to charge Medicare for sicker patients in their care. One recent study estimated that Medicare overpaid Advantage plans by more than $106 billion, that's billions and billions, from 2010 to 2019 due to improper risk adjust adjustments. That's the overcharging based on the coding that they're doing. 
Advantage plans are finding and reporting more diagnoses for their members than are reported for beneficiaries in traditional Medicare. Why are they finding more diagnosis in there? Because they're looking really hard for them because that's called upcoding, which you'll learn about in just a second. That's how they make the most money. Said Richard Cronick, professor, University of California in San Diego and the author of the study, quote, Medicare is supposed to adjust payments downward to reflect differences in how diagnoses are reported in the two programs, but it has not fully done so. As a result, plans are getting paid too much. Medipac, an ind independent congressional agency charged with advising lawmakers on Medicare, has consistently found that Medicare pays more for beneficiaries in Medicare Advantage compared with similar beneficiaries enrolled in regular Medicare. The private program for DCEs that we're talking about, this is in addition to Medicare Advantage, but the same managed care mentality and incentive on payment has been moving forward without much public attention. But that is beginning to change. Last week, more than 50 Democratic members of Congress urged the Biden administration to end the DCE pilot test. Physicians for a national health care plan and other advocates for single payer health care are also working to stop the program. And Dr. Ed Weisbart, I'll I'll show you what he has to say instead of just read it to you. So that's what's going on. And it's pretty interesting, I think. And I want to take you through a couple of the things here. Now, we, we talked about uh, nine months ago, this DCE program is said to be one of the most significant changes to what's happening or proposed to happen with Medicare. No doubt about it. And we just mentioned that talking about Medicare Advantage and the similarities here are how they get paid and how they dispense care and where the incentive is. If the incentive is to pay less for your health care and the less they pay for your health care, the more that they make in profit, then they're very similarly aligned. And I just showed you the Inspector General report over two year period showed that 75% of the denials of care, this is in Medicare Advantage, 75% of when they denied care filed by beneficiaries, these were the appeals, were overturned. In indicating that some beneficiaries and providers were initially denied services and payments that should have been provided. Some, only 75% were denied and later overturned, only 75%. And more people are, they're just don't even know about the appeals process. So I talked about Dr. Turner's letter. We heard about that. Now let me see if I can get um, Katie's thing here to play. That's a big if. Let's see, where is Katie? Here she is. Let's see. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be with you all tonight to talk about why Medicare is so important. Specifically, we are here to talk about direct contacting, contracting entities, DCEs, and why they are such a threat to the Medicare program. Now, this might seem like a super wonky topic, but at the end of the day, we are talking about people's lives and the quality of the health care that they get. So I'm gonna dig in a little bit to the details and highlight some of the other related initiatives that I'm working on to not just protect Medicare, but to improve Medicare. Last year, as you may all know, the Trump administration created a new pilot program in Medicare that relies on direct contracting entities, DCEs, to deliver care to beneficiaries. And this program was supposed to make Medicare more efficient but actually it does just the opposite. Rather than allowing patients to go to providers directly under traditional Medicare, DCEs invite insurers and investors to step in and interfere with the care that Americans get. By adding in these intermediaries, the Trump administration undermined the very purpose of Medicare, which is to provide quality health coverage and increased financial security for seniors. Here's the thing. We know that traditional Medicare works. Since it was established in 1965, Medicare has been enormously successful at improving millions of older Americans' quality of life. Medicare serves approximately one in six Americans and virtually all of the 65 plus population. So given Medicare's incredible success, you might be wondering, why would anyone want to overhaul this program? And the answer, as with too many things in Washington, is the greed of corporate special interests. The bottom line for direct contracting entities is not to improve the quality of care. They drive up costs for patients to maximize their profits. 
And this isn't hypothetical. We know exactly what happens when insurers dip their hands into Medicare, because we've already seen that play out in Medicare Advantage. As you all know, unlike traditional Medicare, Medicare Advantage allows insurers to manage healthcare plans. The result is that Medicare Advantage costs taxpayers more money than traditional Medicare, and it provides less information for agencies, and more importantly, the American people, to determine whether the program is working. When an independent government watchdog investigated Medicare Advantage, it uncovered widespread denials of care. I want to repeat, Medicare Advantage costs more money. I wish I did have my whiteboard. Medicare Advantage costs more money, is less transparent, and provides worse care. We should not open the door to more corporate abuse of Medicare. And this direct contracting entity model risks even more patients being denied the care they need and leaving taxpayers with a higher bill. It is no surprise that Wall Street investors hope to see more direct contracting entities in our healthcare system. Because for them, direct contracting entities are a fantastic opportunity to rake in cash by investing early so they can eventually get bought out by insurers. Wall Street wins, patients and taxpayers lose. Not only is it wrong to let Wall Street abuse Medicare, it's wrong for Medicare beneficiaries to be auto-assigned into direct contracting entities without their knowledge and without their consent. Part of what makes investing in DCE so lucrative is that they don't have to to spend a dime on marketing, unlike Medicare Advantage, which is paying Joe Namath to peddle it on TV commercials. Instead, these direct contracting entities just bamboozle Americans directly into their for-profit scheme for Medicare. Now, throughout his time in the White House, President Trump talked a lot about the wonders of capitalism. Well, I am a proud capitalist and a former business law professor, and I can tell you that two of the foundational building blocks of capitalism are consumer choice and information. And without those fundamental principles, we don't have healthy markets, and consumers are more likely to get cheated. Direct contracting entities are, in fact, anti-capitalist. And that is part of the reason that back in May, I joined three of my House colleagues in a letter to HHS Secretary Becerra and the Acting Administrator of CMS urging them to immediately freeze the DCE pilot program, I am going to continue to stand up against misguided plans that would decrease Medicare's quality and cost taxpayers more. Part of the reason that we elected President Biden is his commitment to protecting access to health care and to lowering its costs. Medicare is incredibly popular, and the Biden administration should do everything in its power to dismantle DCEs. Medicare has broad bipartisan support among the American people, and I know this because I read it represent a district that is about evenly split between Democrats and Republicans. The 45th Congressional District in California also is home to the second largest retirement community in the country. And I hear from constituents on Medicare, Democrats, Republicans, and independents alike, that they like Medicare. And I hear from people who are not yet eligible that they want the program to be there for them when they become eligible. Medicare is popular because Medicare works. And of course, there are places where it falls short. But part of being a champion for Medicare is working to build on the program's successes we can and should improve and expand Medicare so that it's strong for generations to come. If the proponents of the Trump administration's DCE pilot are serious about strengthening Medicare, rather than dismantling it and auctioning off the pieces, I have some ideas for how they could help. House Democrats are working on passing HR3, the Elijah Cummings Lower Drug Costs Now Act, a sweeping package that would allow Medicare to negotiate better drug prices bring down costs for Americans on Medicare and for those getting their prescriptions on the commercial market. The nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office estimated this would save taxpayers nearly half a trillion dollars and bring down the cost of drugs by 50 to 75%. I'm proud that my bill, the Freedom from Price Gouging Act, 
was included in HR3. And this legislation is pretty simple. It says to drug companies, if you price gouge, if you hike your prices way beyond inflation, you need to give that money back to the taxpayers who are footing the bill through Medicare. Big pharma and Wall Street investors should not be able to profit from unreasonable price hikes. And if they do, we need to hold them accountable. There you have it. It's true. And uh, she's a Democratic rep um, House of Representatives person from California. And I want you to hear from two doctors, uh, two doctors who are unbiased, and they'll tell you exactly what's going on with this. If you've not yet done so, please do me a favor so that we can continue to bring you the news, the good, the bad, and the ugly, and the potentially bad about Medicare. If you've not yet done so, please subscribe. Yeah, over there. Hit the subscribe button that's on YouTube or on Facebook if you can like the post that you're seeing here, the video. We'd like to keep bringing these to you. And you can hit the little alert bell on YouTube and that can happen. So now the next clip I'm going to play for you is um, it's Dr. Weisbart. And he goes into some detail about not only the direct contracting entity, but the the chassis upon which it's built with the payments. And it's very important. You might think this is really wonky to get this far into the weeds about Medicare Advantage, but that's the payment model that they're going for. So it's important that you know what's behind it and how Medicare Advantage makes their, their big money. This is very revealing. It's not found anywhere else on YouTube. And yet this doctor went through the great lengths to make this graphic so you can understand how it is that these companies profit without charging you any premium because most Medicare Advantage plans are literally charging no premium now. Well, how can that possibly be? Well, now you're going to see how that is and how they do the upcoding. And let me put this back here. And here's the good old doctor. So stick around. Got more after this. This is really good stuff, though. I read Weisbart, and I am a proud member of good old fashioned traditional Medicare. Say I'm proud of that because Medicare is a fabulous program. Traditional Medicare has been saving seniors' lives, it's been improving seniors' health, and it's been actually saving our country a fortune by uh, really controlling the cost of healthcare. Medicare does a great job at rescuing seniors from bankruptcy. We, I don't know where we would be without the traditional Medicare program today. But the reason I want to talk to you is because aside from traditional Medicare, there's a separate program called Medicare Advantage that um, has some issues going on that I think you should know about. And the issues that I'm going to describe to you in Medicare Advantage uh, are very similar to issues that are going to crop up in a new concept called direct contracting entities. But those direct contracting entities are really brand new. We don't have much data about that. So I'll be talking to you about the data from Medicare Advantage uh, about this particular uh, trick that they can do to increase the money that they're paid by Medicare. I think it's important to understand it. Um, because it has implications for all sorts of reforms. And I believe it's a direct threat to the Medicare program that so many of us know and love. The, the gambit that we're trying to talk about tonight is called upcoding. And it's an arcane term, uh, but the Office of Inspector General uh, just recently declared that upcoding is a major driver of improper payments in the Medicare Advantage program. And that means that they are essentially being able to drain funds from the Medicare Trust Fund, uh, and that has an impact on our premiums and all sorts of things. So we need to understand this. To start, we need to understand what Medicare Advantage is, uh, and it's basically following a long history of privatizing Medicare. So, you know, Medicare, traditional Medicare is set up so that we pay our taxes, of course, and then uh, that funds the Medicare program. Traditional Medicare directly uh, pays physicians and hospitals and other organizations. So Medicare is, is pretty direct in how they work this out. Uh, there are some Medicare managed administrators, but it's pretty much run by the Medicare program. Separate and apart from that is what's called Medicare Advantage. So here, instead of Medicare having a relationship with the physicians and hospitals, Medicare doesn't have that for these people. And instead it pays insurance companies, commercial insurance companies, Aetna, Essence, Anthem, and, and others. So instead of paying doctors directly uh, in Medicare Advantage, uh, the federal government pays our money to the insurance companies who then pay uh, doctors and hospitals. 
Now, there's a number of issues with that arrangement beyond the scope for tonight, but you need to understand that that's traditional Medicare versus Medicare Advantage. Um, within Medicare Advantage, there are a number of things that concern me. Uh, the one tonight is what you could almost call the Medicare Advantage upcoding money machine. So let's explain this. Primary care physicians submit their claims, their bills for what they did. Uh, and on those bills, they write down diagnostic codes, numbers that explain, that describe the specific diagnosis that a patient has. Uh, and then those codes are sent into the Medicare Advantage plan, because uh, that's where they're going to get paid, as we mentioned a moment ago. The Medicare Advantage plan then can use those codes to submit to Medicare a description of how sick or healthy the patients are. So the Medicare Advantage plan tells Medicare, look at all these diagnostic codes that the primary care physicians are submitting. And somewhat appropriately, conceptually, Medicare then pays the Medicare Advantage plan more to take care of patients who have a bunch of high level diagnostic codes. If you're, if Medicare Advantage plan is carrying for, is paying for sicker patients uh, than anybody else, than traditional Medicare, it only makes sense that Medicare would be paying the Medicare Advantage plan more money for the more complicated, sicker patients. And indeed, that's what this shows. The physician enters a diagnostic code showing that the patient has these illnesses. Uh, that goes to the Medicare Advantage plan, who then tells Medicare, hey, look, I got all these sick people, pay me more per person because look how sick they are. That fund doesn't come out of thin air. The money to pay the Medicare Advantage plans uh, comes directly from either the Medicare Trust Fund, which has to support this, or from Medicare members uh, through the course of paying their premiums. So that's where the money, of course, comes from. There's no magic money. Uh, and then the Medicare Advantage plan can use that to make some slight, sometimes more significant improvements in what kind of insurance product they offer. A most notable one is that the Medicare Advantage plan uses these extra funds to lower or sometimes eliminate any premium so that some people can actually join Medicare Advantage for free, uh, maybe even not able to keep paying their Medicare Part B uh, premium. So because they're able to figure out a number of tricks, one of which we'll talk to tonight, uh, to get more money out of Medicare, they're able to offer more robust benefits sometimes and, and, um, and, and reduce the premium. So getting those up codes, getting the higher uh, coding from physicians is critical to being able to offer uh, lower premiums and expanded benefits. Uh, and then when they do those things, of course, more people are lured in uh, and they join the Medicare Advantage plan, the plan grows. What happens when the plan grows? Well, these are often private, uh, commercially owned uh, for-profit companies, uh, which then are able to offer higher dividends, more stock buybacks, and more profits, uh, bottom line, for the practice owners. Profits that, as we showed earlier, are coming out of uh, the Medicare Trust Fund or seniors paying premiums. Um, those dollars then, of course, are used to stimulate more primary care coding. If they can come up with tools to get more primary care doctors to submit more complicated codes, that's the game. That's the money machine. They fund these, these tools. And I'm going to show you how this coding has become a very effective business imperative uh, for Wall Street. So this particular tool we're going to talk about is coding, which essentially drives what's called a risk score, which, as I said, is appropriately gets Medicare to pay the Medicare Advantage plans more if they can increase the risk code. So what is this risk code? Uh, the acronym is HCC, a hierarchical condition category, or you could just think of it as the, the risk code, really. So here's an example of a very healthy 76-year-old uh, who has nothing else wrong uh, with her. Uh, and so her risk code adds up to a total of 0 0.45. And because of that, uh, in 2019, when this particular report was published, Medicare would be paying the Medicare Advantage plan $4,000 per year. There aren't that many 76-year-olds that are in such incredibly good health. So here's one that has some pretty common illnesses. Again, 76 years old, 76 years old baseline payment is again 0 0.45 risk, risk code, but she has these other diagnoses, diabetes, congestive heart failure, and a few other things. And because of those extra diagnoses, which are real in this case, so let's say, so Medicare would then pay the Medicare Advantage plan substantially more per year for taking care of this person since the Medicare Advantage plan has to pay their bills. That's kind of the deal. Sicker patient, Medicare Advantage gets more money. Conceptually, that's the way it probably should work. 
But, you know, once you set up those kinds of rules, it's whack-a-mole, here's a new game. Uh, let's figure out how to make those codes the best codes. You know, there's rules for which codes get which payment. There's exact rule, high, low, rules about this. And so the game is to come up with the right diagnostic codes, not sort of just the typical diagnostic codes. So for example, uh, obesity doesn't get you anything if you're a Medicare Advantage plan, but morbid obesity, well, now we're talking. Um, depression, nothing. But major depression, a single episode mild, who would know that's worse? Uh, that gives you more, more payment. And all of these things, these subtle differences in codes, which might even be synonymous, but these subtle differences in codes add up to a substantially higher risk score. And here's the bottom line. Medicare pays the Medicare Advantage plan for this optimized coding, $32,000 a year, more than three times as much if the primary care physician is more casually paying attention to the coding. $32,000 a year from one patient. That's insane. System. So there's a big game to get to the $32,000 from the $9,000. The second type of incentive is to share risk score payments. So um, this is a direct quote, overall physicians in the, in the value-based program with Humana can get two and a half times more than the fee schedule, value-based. That means that these are people who are being encouraged to find these codes. And on average, sometimes they get four and a half times the fee schedule. So if they're in this program, if they're not in this program, their fee for their equivalent might be $44 per member per month. That's how they think about these numbers is per member per month, right? Because that's how the cap capitation works. But if they get into this program, they make they may make four and a half times as much for being involved in these in these programs that share the risk score payments back with the primary care physicians. Or lastly, they might actually, actually in many cases, now they're starting to purchase the physician practices to really internalize all the value. And one of the more recent examples of that, uh, Humana introduced its own brand name group for the primary care physicians that it owns. This is a big deal. This is a big deal. Uh, the Center for, the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget said that this is worth over the upcoming seven year period, worth two to three and a half billion dollars. Uh, this, this is worth two and a half to three billion dollars. As I told you earlier, the Office of Inspector General said this is a major issue for uh, for funding in Medicare. These kinds of numbers, these kinds of numbers, in addition to draining the Medicare trust fund and essentially leading us towards really a less stable finance for for the entire Medicare program, these kinds of numbers are the kinds of numbers that get attention on Wall Street. So that's a big deal because we have. On the advocacy side, we've been focused on the Medicare Advantage piece, right? We've been focused on everything I just said, all of the numbers I've just given you come from our experience with Medicare Advantage and in the healthcare reform advocacy movement, we've been sort of watching with, with some trepidation how Medicare Advantage is using all the gains we've showed you to be able to lower premiums and do other things to attract membership. And hence, here's been what almost looks like a relentless march of growth um, of Medicare Advantage members. And to be honest, well, many of us have not paid enough attention to, to what is from Wall Street's perspective, a bigger potential financial opportunity. Yeah, Medicare Advantage has been growing and using all the tricks that I have showed you, but Medicare traditional, good old fashioned Medicare, the kind I have, the kind that 60% of seniors have, that's potentially some untapped market because a lot of the stuff that we've been talking about and things, other similar things that we have not covered tonight, those are things that are off limits in traditional Medicare. Traditional, these things don't happen. Some, a lot of the things that happen to drain the trust fund to Medicare Advantage, commercial insurance companies, those don't happen in traditional Medicare. And so the for-profit private venture, private equity venture capital world has been looking at this 60% of untouched Medicare members and thinking, hmm, I want to get my hands on that. And that's where this new concept uh, has been, this new uh, pilot project is coming up called direct contracting entities. Direct contracting entities is essentially a way to, to introduce the uh, for-profit um, uh, corporate world, uh, not just into Medicare Advantage, but into 
into traditional uh, Medicare. So we showed you this, right? We showed you traditional Medicare with very few, if any, real intermediaries, perhaps some administrators, but no real intermediaries versus Medicare Advantage. So direct contracting entities introduce new risk-bearing intermediaries into Medicare. Um, they're, they're today in the pilot phase. Uh, they are not taking over all of Medicare tonight, um, but this is a pilot project that's sort of in the, in the early stages. And if we want to protect Medicare from this, from all the same shenanigans that I was talking about and more, um, now is the time that we need to focus on this. Most of these new things, these direct contracting entities are investor owned. So some are owned by physician groups and by and by um, specialty providers and ACOs, uh, again, an acronym, acronym is beyond tonight's scope, but most of them are owned by investors. Most direct contracting entities are either publicly traded or publicly backed by private equity and venture capital. And six of them are owned actually by commercial insurance industry companies, six. There are 53 of them uh, today uh, in 2021. There are 53 of these direct contracting entities and six of the 53 are owned by insurance companies who have all the skills we were just talking about from Medicare Advantage, they have those skills. Those six are not just six out of 53, they actually represent the majority of people that are being uh, enrolled into direct contract entities. So those six are only six out of 53, but that's uh, they are the largest uh, group um, of companies here, of, of organizations here. So direct contract entities, to spend a little bit of time on it, is a project uh, that was begun under the Trump administration as a pilot project uh, within the centers for the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. The Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation uh, is something that was created uh, de novo uh, as a part of the Affordable Care Act, because at the time the ACA was enacted, there was quite a probably valid sense that there was anti-reform inertia within within the Medicare program. And so they create the ACA created uh, under Section 3021 with uh, a small fortune of money. They created this new department called the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation. They've done a lot of things uh, since they've done dozens of pilot projects, some better, some worse. Um, and so some of it, you know, it's, it's a good conceptual kind of uh, thing here. Uh, a, a CMMI pilot can be a, start as a pilot within the Medicare Innovation Center, and then if if the health, if health and Human Services and Health and Human Services Actuary, in fact, uh, declare that it's a, that it's a success, they can roll it out across the entire book of Medicare business, across the entire book of Medicare business. So they have to meet some criteria under the law. They have to show that their pilot program reduces spending without decreasing quality or improves quality without increasing spending and doesn't deny or limit coverage or provision of benefits. So uh, that was what they were, if they can meet those criteria, if they decide that they have met those criteria, then these innovations can be rolled out across the entire book of Medicare business uh, without having to go back to Congress uh, for any further approval. So it's entirely in-house for Medicare to make that uh, decision. So these new DCEs are gonna be under pressure are under pressure to do the same coding trick, right? So the DCEs, the direct the direct contracting entities, engage primary care physicians. That's the way they grow, um, and then Medicare contracts the DCE for that primary care physicians' patients, and then the direct con contracting entity can maximize their capitation from Medicare by driving up coding in exactly the same way we were talking about. The reward for up coding and direct contracting entities is not as incredibly dramatic as I spelled out here for Medicare Advantage today, but it is still very substantial. The exact percentage is something that is not completely understood yet, but it's it's going to be a pretty substantial piece. So this, this gambit that I was showing you tonight uh, applies to not just Medicare Advantage, but it's the same mechanism that's going to be, um, be applied under the direct contracting model unless we stop the direct contracting model. So this co direct contracting model really represents a potential a privatization of the rest of Medicare. There's 60% of us in Medicare who have traditional, good old fashioned Medicare, original Medicare, and then 40% of us have, 41% uh, of now are in Medicare Advantage. So that 60% is not privatized, not commercial, it's entirely publicly run and runs beautifully and effectively. Direct contracting is a way for the insurance, for the for-profit industries to, to fully privatize bit by bit, not tonight, but over the next few years, 
fully privatize our public good, which is a complete violation of the spirit of a public health program and, and, and changes the focus from better national health into larger corporate profits, corroding the value of a public health plan, increasing the opportunities for profiteering. There you have it, in the doctor's own words. He tells you behind the scenes, which you've probably never seen before, about how the upcoding is actually making more money for the Medicare Advantage. That's how it's always worked. That's what the inspector general found. It's a big, big problem. And yet each administration, as we've gone through the last two at least, they identify the fact that they're getting ripped off Medicare. They have a, a model where CMS comes after the Medicare Advantage company and they say, you owe us millions of dollars. And then mysteriously, as we've covered before, CMS never collects on that. Why is that? Maybe it's all the thousands of lobbyists on K Street in Washington, D.C. who work for the health insurance lobby. I don't know, just maybe. Here's Dr. Dr. Kimball, and his is, I assure you, a lot shorter, but some pretty good stuff here. When you get for-profit entities coming in as middlemen, what they try to do is make it sound like what they're going to do is give better care and that's how they're going to save money. And what they really do is they cherry pick and lemon drop and game documentation to beat risk adjustment. So the rationale for shifting risk onto intermediaries is that the theory is that we have such expensive health care because we deliver too many services because fee for service incentivizes maximizing volume of care. Therefore, the solution is if you push insurance risk onto providers of care, like doctors and hospitals, and they're held accountable for the cost of care, then they keep more money by delivering less care, and then they will not deliver unnecessary care due to fee for service. But this requires big data. You've got to be able to track uh, how sick people are, what their risk is, try to figure out how much to charge for your or negotiate for for your capitation rate. The problem is the premise is false. Utilization of care in the U.S. is toward the low end of industrialized countries that cover everyone for half what we do, usually using fee-for-service. And there's no evidence of excessive utilization in primary care paid with fee-for-service, yet that's who we're trying to capitate. And risk shifting creates perverse incentives to skimp on care and avoid sicker or socially disadvantaged patients, aggravating disparities. And the counter incentives to these are pay for outcomes, which increases the incentive to cherry pick and risk adjustment, which is way too complex to do accurately and just leads to a lot of gaming. So we tried risk shifting with managed care in the 90s, with pay for performance in the 2000s, with value-based payment in the 2010s, uh, and value-based payment was built into the Affordable Care Act. And now we have direct contracting entities in 2021, which is the latest effort to apply the same idea, shift risk on intermediaries. <clears throat> so if you try to use market forces to control prices, which is the theory in US healthcare, the administrative costs are five to six times out of public systems. The incentive is to avoid risk. There's a race to the bottom among plans and misguided and costly efforts to manage healthcare via bureaucracy. And it doesn't improve healthcare, reduce costs, or add value. Forms of intermediaries are an HMO and enrollees sign up for the plan. They are, they are members. They either pay a premium or the government pays it for them. And they have to get all their care from that system. And that system then, if they deliver too much care, they lose money. And if they skimp on care or enroll healthy people, then they make money. And Medicare Advantage and Medicaid Managed Care are examples of HMOs. So a direct contracted contracting entity is a new animal that's created to get the rest of regular Medicare captured by capitation and fiscal intermediaries, or basically to privatize the rest of Medicare. And like ACOs, you don't sign up for a DCE. Whoever you see for primary care, if they joined a DCE, then you get aligned with that DCE uh, using the terminology CMS is using. And there are 53 pilot DCEs around the country, most sponsored by physician and hospital-led ACOs, some by insurance companies, and some by venture capitalists who are looking to see making profits off of taxpayer-funded health care. The insurance companies, there's only six of them out of 53, but they cover 57% of all the people that are in DCE. So they're actually the largest section. The GEO version of a DCE would force all traditional Medicare patients into DCAs within a defined geographic area. 
But this has been put on hold by the Biden administration, and we don't know if it's going to get implemented. But that would completely eliminate traditional Medicare in, in, the, in the specified geographic areas. <laughs> there it goes. That was weird. Just wouldn't stop playing. Right. Again. Oh, it's back. Okay, good. So that was Dr. Stephen Kimball talking about the profitability in the private plan and the efficiency in the fee-for-service, which is traditional Medicare. A lot of people don't understand. They think that they sign up for a no-cost, what they call free Medicare Advantage HMO, and they don't understand until they get sick the restrictions that are in that. They don't understand until they need tests and hospitalization, all the prior authorizations that are necessary. I encourage you, if you've not yet seen it, search my YouTube channel for prior authorization. See what the doctors have to say about that nightmare fiasco that goes on within managed care. But I want to share with you this. This is a letter uh, just sent three weeks ago this year, uh, fully, well, almost one whole year into the Biden administration. This is sent by 50 Democratic congressional folks uh, thanking the Secretary Becerra over at um, HHS for his leadership, welcome, all that kind of stuff. It says, we're writing to ask you to take a step further by permanently ending the program, DCE program, and coordinating the traditional, I'm sorry, the transition of traditional Medicare beneficiaries in these programs back into traditional Medicare. That's what they want done. It says, as you know, the previous administration started the DCE program, which are privately owned and controlled coverage networks in which for-profit companies are paid monthly to cover beneficiaries' health care. Any funds left over after it covers care are kept as profits, creating a perverse motive. It's not my word. It's their word. A perverse motive to decrease the quality and volume of seniors' care. Ain't that something? These models ultimately aim to privatize traditional Medicare by funneling beneficiaries without their knowledge into a DCE. Unfortunately for patients in these entities, DCEs are incentivized to funnel patients to providers within their networks to maximize profits, maximize profits, which can limit patients' care options. Hmm. These models transform the care of a traditional Medicare beneficiary to care typically seen in a what? A Medicare Advantage plan. Despite the fact that the patient chose not to enroll in Medicare Advantage for a reason. Had, uh, was it two or four uh, this week? It, time flies by. So I had either two or four conversations this week, but the last four conversations I've had with brand new insurance agents in the industry, I run a website called MedicareAgentTraining.com. And for the last, what, since 2012, we've been documenting the growth of our agency all the way from when it was just me until we've had 18 people in the office. And in that business model, I just help brand new agents to get started. And in the last four out of four cases, these insurance agents, and this is an important side note, came to me saying, I found you on YouTube, but I was recruited into the, age, into the industry by either Monster or Indeed, recruited into the insurance world, and I was never told about Medicare supplements, they say. They were only trained to go get the AHIP course, which is the healthcare industry's representative up in Washington, by the way. They train you on how to navigate the world of Medicare Advantage. But that's the only training they were given. And they were told, go sign up seniors for Medicare Advantage. They were never shown that the senior even has the choice to stay on original Medicare or what a Medicare supplement was until they found me on the training on YouTube. Isn't that, didn't it blow your mind? How many of you, please comment below, were shown by an agent only options about signing up for Medicare Advantage? It is a huge problem. I don't know how these agencies can sleep at night. I know why they do it, because they make a far larger override as, an, as a recruiting agency on Medicare Advantage plan sales than they do traditional Medicare supplements which keeps your original Medicare, which means you can go to any doctor, any hospital in the country that works with Medicare, which is just about everybody. No networks, no prior authorizations, no referrals, no restrictions. The world is your oyster. But 
these brand new agents are never shown that. So if the agents are not shown that there's two different worlds, Medicare and Medicare Advantage, then how can you, if you're relying on a licensed insurance agent, rely on the advice that they're giving you if they only know that there's only one trick in the in the game here? It's like, how do you how do you handle being a carpenter if the only tool that you have is a hammer? You just hammer everything. And that's what most of these agents are being trained in when they're in the industry for less than two or three years. Medicare Advantage is the only way. Medicare Advantage. You can have this Medicare Advantage or that Medicare Advantage, but Medicare Advantage is the only way. It just blows my mind how much of a lack of training there is in our industry to take care of our seniors. It's on the stinking life and health test, but they just forget that. It was like, hey, go out and sell this. It's, it's just sick. These I'll go back. These models transform the care of a traditional Medicare beneficiary to care typically seen in private Medicare Advantage plans, despite the fact that the patient chose not to enroll in an MA plan. DCEs pose a threat to patient care and outcomes due to the encroachment of profit-driven organizations on their care. Encroachment. Profit-driven. In fact, the majority of the 53 current DCEs are investor-owned, should have a hyphen there, and controlled. Owners of DCEs include private equity firms and large private health insurance companies. There's some stats down there for you. This model disrupts the sanctity of traditional public Medicare benefits by giving control of beneficiary care to private interests. In fact, in the original request for proposals for potential DCE contractors, the previous Trump administration mentioned that they specifically wanted, quote, organizations currently operating exclusively in the Medicare Advantage program, end quote, to take part in this model. Further, these models remove some of the protections for beneficiaries under traditional Medicare and with a supplement. And according to CMS, they, quote, include a reduced set of quality measures. Why would they reduce the quality measures in this program? Seniors are one of the most vulnerable populations served in healthcare, and they need more protections not less. The private equity firms and private insurance companies that are currently operating will or will operate DCEs already take large profits from their other healthcare ventures and will likely do the same from Medicare DCEs at the expense of patient care. For example, Medicare Advantage plans currently use upcoding or adding extra diagnosis codes to patient charts to receive more money from the Medicare trust fund to increase their profits. And it shows a footnote here, and that I'm sure that's talking about the HHS investigation that found that that's the profit motive. This scheme already cost the U.S. government $10.6 billion per year. And with the addition of traditional Medicare beneficiaries into this scheme, these costs will almost surely rise. DCEs are projected to spend as low as 60% of the taxpayer dollars they receive actually on care, allowing them to keep up to 40% as profit, further funneling taxpayer doctors into profits, not patient care. In order to protect the Medicare solvency and Medicare beneficiaries, we request meeting with you to discuss how to stop the expansion of the DCE model and oversee the sunsetting of these programs. And there's the footnotes for it. Now, on the other side, to be completely fair and balanced, as they say, I want to show you some uh, an organization that really thinks this is the best thing since sliced bread. I mean, it's just these DCE models are going to be fantastic for everybody. Let's look for the lobbying group the Americans Physicians Groups. It's a national association representing 335, not physicians, but physician groups. And they can be owned by hospitals and insurance companies, by the way, with approximately 170,000 physicians. So this is a large group. And what do they have to say? Well, they wrote to Secretary Becerra also, but they had a totally different take. In fact, they said, Americans Physicians Group and the undersigned organizations would like to thank you for your continued efforts and working. Yeah, that's the kiss up sentence. And then as an associating representing hundreds of healthcare organizations, not patients, representing the organizations that are engaged in moving away from our dysfunctional and unsustainable fee for service reimbursement structure toward a clinically integrated value based healthcare system, which lowers cost and improves patient care. We recognize the important work within your teams that your teams do in supporting alternate payment models and the providers who work within them. It is in this spirit 
the spirit of looking out for everyone and containing costs and improving quality that we write in response to recent criticisms of this, you know, DCE model, reporting in The Hill and other publications, as well as letters sent to you by those Congress people, members of House of Rep. What do they know? We're a professional organization. We represent physicians groups. The opinion pieces referenced above express concerns about this model and allege that the model has the potential to disrupt Medicare. No, one piece characterized the plot as a middleman between patients and Medicare that stifles patient choice. In the end, it recommended that to protect patient interests throughout Medicare, the Biden administration must stop this program entirely. We strongly disagree. This program presents an invaluable opportunity to study in real time the effects of a capitated payment system has on primary care in the United States. Let's study it because we don't know enough under Medicare Advantage of how it will come out at the end. Let's just study it for a few more years. The model also provides resources opening the door to expansion of primary care into distressed communities that have previously been unreachable by proactively empowering primary care doctors to serve underserved communities that are disproportionately affected by the consequences of health disparities. And there's that big word that they know will trigger the democratic response, the inequities. Let's solve that for the benefit of the people, the downtrodden. This organization seeks to work alongside Health and Human Services and the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services and other agencies to allow those closest to the Medicare beneficiaries and their care, such as our physicians and physician groups, to not be encumbered by the fee-for-service system and the barriers that exist within it, barriers which prevent physicians groups from undertaking activities geared toward addressing social determinants of health, coordinating care, and other beneficial aspects of treatment to say nothing of the profit behind it. Let's not talk about that. Recognizing these groups and paying them differently in accordance with their activities that allow for, finally, greater health outcomes and patient care. Well, I'm glad we got to that on page three. The, way down here somewhere buried in, oh, by the way, yeah, we are concerned about greater health outcomes and patient care. Through programs such as the direct contracting model, it is positive for both Medicare beneficiaries and for the Medicare program itself. Contrary to what is claimed in the opinion pieces and all the doctors, everybody beneficiaries. Oh my gosh, man, how do they do this? As they see the direct contracting model as the next iteration of the accountable care organization model, which will empower primary care doctors to transition into performance-based risk contracting while delivering better value to patients through the coordination of care. They're gonna coordinate me again across multiple settings. Direct contracting entities build upon the learnings. They build upon the learnings. The learnings, the learnings. This is the doctor wrote this. What was learned from earlier accountable care organization models by introducing new concepts. Wait, they're gonna build upon the, what they already learned by doing something different and new, including capitation and unique benchmarking and represent a gradual evolutionary path toward, I love evolution coming in, path towards supporting physicians to manage, manage a population and accept risk tied to quality outcomes. This model is not without its imperfections, but in addressing areas that can be improved, it is important that we do not end the program prematurely. Let's just study it for a few more years. It can serve as a learning ground for groups moving into value-based care with the availability of capitated payments and unique program aspects. Man, that's just amazing. I mean, with a with something like that, I mean, how can you just not say, let's just throw money at it? Let's just see what happens. Let's just kick it around for a while. Put the seniors in. Don't even let them know. Just We'll just take it on the back end and see what happens. In case you missed it. This is a really good video to watch. It's on our channel. It's about the investigation from Health and Human Services about Medicare Advantage. I highly encourage you to watch it. Why? Because nobody else on YouTube covered it. Why not? I'll tell you why not. Because most of the things that you're seeing on YouTube are, here's what the Medicare deductible is. Here's what Part B covers. Here's what Part A covers. All the stuff that you can find in your handy-dandy Medicare and you 
guidebook. I'm not here to cover this. Yes, we do Medicare insurance, but what we do more than anything is we advocate for our clients. We get involved with our senators and our Congress people to see what we can do to make a difference actually in Washington. I pay members membership dues to an organization that actually lobbies Congress on behalf of the clients, on behalf of the seniors. So I think it's very important that whoever you work with for your health insurance is actually not just taking applications based on here's what you do, here's what you do, but they're at the forefront of finding out what's going wrong and actually trying to solve it, trying to fix it and have their hands actually dirty and helping clients every day, because that's what I do. But anyway, you need to watch this video over there because it's very, 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 very interesting. Read the study. You can Google it. Medicare Advantage appeal outcomes and audit findings raise concerns. Who's concerned? The Inspector General about the service and de payment denials. This is payment to your providers saying, no, you can't go there. And then Health Payer Intelligence article. I have a paid subscription, but I don't know if you need it or not for this article. OIG finds that profits are to blame. Read the study. I highly encourage you or watch my video where I have the whole thing in there. You can search my channel for Medicare Advantage Investigation by OIG. This is our group of people. All we do is help people with Medicare insurance. And if you're in a Medicare Advantage plan and you want to get a second opinion, if you're on a Medicare supplement plan, you want to get a second opinion and see what your options are, I highly encourage you to reach out to us. I'm going to go and look and see if we have any uh, questions or concerns from people in here. And if you would, please leave a comment below about what you thought about this revelation. Now, where does it currently stand today? I'll tell you. The Biden administration is looking at it very carefully, but as we're seeing from all these members of Congress who are really getting excited about this in the last three weeks, we believe that this program is about to enter its phase two, which is more DCE models, more contracts given, and open it up for bids again under the Biden administration in this um, second year that just started. So that's where we think it's headed. That's where the people in Congress think that it's headed. And we'll have to wait and see what comes out of there. And if you've not yet done so, please put a comment below and we're going to go look at those right now. And I've been trying to follow them. I love that, Sandy. Let's get a busload of people and go down to Washington. Yep, done that before. When the government says, we'll keep you safe and healthy, don't get on the train, run for your life. That's a good one. Let's say... Um, all physicians are company docs now. That's happening more and more. Peggy, thanks for watching. I always appreciate your encouraging comments, Peggy. Thank you, because I read every single one of them. Who can we write, write to express our concerns? What are concise points where we can Google? Uh, well, Google, pinpoint. Uh, I always Google, like, who is my congressman, congressman, my congressman, or something like that. And it pulls up a map, and you can see exactly who your Congress people are and your senators. I would write one email and then copy it and paste that email to every one of those representatives. Physicians groups have been replacing private practices for years and squeezing doctors. That is true. Very true. Is WellMed a DCE? That I don't know the answer to. And I know there's been an active discussion going on. Let's see. Th this one's true. When the rubber hits the road, it's all about the money. There's a song about that. I checked it out before we went on Medicare and have a brother-in-law who told me his mother's experience with Advantage. Wow. I appreciate y'all's comments. Very positive here. And let's see. I think that's about it for here. As things continue to change and develop in Medicare... Let's see. Oh, wow. Bruce, I'm going to have to look for this. I wrote you a letter this past week because my wife received one of those letters. Bruce, if you can, if you feel up to it, if you want to scratch out any personal information, that's fine. But if you could scan that even with your phone and upload it to our site, we have a secure place to do that. It is at seniorsavingsnetwork.org forward slash secure, S-E-C-U-R-E, seniorsavingsnetwork.org forward slash secure. If you want to send us any documents, we'd have to look at, love to look at that. And we absolutely positively would not um, 
share that with anybody. I mean, your personal information on there. We'll be contacting you in a couple of months. I turn 65 in June. Oh, that's awesome. If I leave a brief. Yes, you will live and not die. Um, as to what your options are for Medicare, that's a common question. When should you reach out? When should you do something about Medicare insurance to look at what those options are? Six months before you turn 65, or if you're continuing to work past 65, six months before you plan on leaving your employer plan, if you're actively employed, you should look out for your Medicare options. Why do I say that? With the Medicare supplement world, that's staying on original Medicare and just supplementing what Medicare does not pay, you have an, a great option there to lock in today's rate, even six months in advance. And what that does is it prevents you from having a potential rate increase that everybody else on the plan might be experiencing in those six months. You don't have that. So if you sign up now in January, even though you're turning 65 in June, we could lock in the January rate for you, but it does not start charging you until June. And then all the companies that we work with have a 12 month rate guarantee. So essentially you could in June of this year, lock in a rate that cannot change for 18 months past today. So up to six months before you start on Medicare, you can lock in a Medicare supplement plan. A lot of agents don't know that because they only sell Medicare Advantage and they say, oh no, three months before, the month of, and three months after. That's for Advantage plans. Medicare supplements have six months before and then six months after your Part B starts for your open enrollment period where you can get a Medicare supplement using your open enrollment. Um, and that's about it. And if you have any questions, any comments, anything that we can help with, please comment below. But if you need help from us, don't just comment if you can reach out to us. If you go to the website, which is SeniorSavingsNetwork.org, you can actually see a form where you can pick what your situation is, fill out the information, put your cell phone number if it's okay for us to text you. And that way we can start a conversation without you having to wait for a voicemail to be uh, replied to. And typically when we do a live stream and there are going to be a couple thousand people watching this in the first day, our phones will get very, very busy. Well, we can go through and text and reply back by email if we can't even get on the phone because our people are magical at multitasking. We might not be able to get on the phone back with everybody that replied back the same day that we did a live video like this. Um, so that's all there is to know about that. And as things happen, things change, I will be bringing them to you. Thank you. God bless you. Thanks for watching. And anything I can do for you, please read, reach out to my office. We'll be here for you. Take care. Thank you.